Can you walk through the components of the the BIA that you conducted within Ivanti? Sure. Um, as I said, it's you start by understanding your business, and the the key component, let's say step one, is identifying the mission of your business. What is it that your organization does? What is their sole purpose? That takes uh, interaction with executive leadership. Uh, sometimes businesses have this set up. They've got a, a whole group of people to do that. Sometimes it takes a little bit of reflection. So once you understand the mission, the purpose, and, and what you guys are trying to do, then it's identifying all of the processes that support the mission. Now, at the early stages, you're not excluding or, or narrowing down things. It's very much exploratory. You want to identify everything that goes on in your company, create a little uh, pocket for it. We'll call it a, a process, right? And And so you've got individual processes that support your mission, whether that's the development process, whether that's uh, support, whether that's HR, right? It, it's these various activities that are going on that you can um, combine together into a process. And once you get the process from uh, there, it's documenting everything about it. Talk to people, see what goes on, see how that looks, right? And then ultimately, you whittle it down from there by thinking about your, your risk and what's really critical to support the mission. But it all starts um, in understanding your business. Ivanti has a fairly diverse business in general. Like uh, I know that in the conversations we had, we talked about everything from like my product management team and the th activities that we're doing on a regular basis to things like our patch content creation and the fact that we've got to deliver on very tight SLAs for, uh, let's say, a new Chrome Zero Day comes out. Our customers may have very tight turnarounds. We've got to deliver content to them globally in a very short period of time, we've got our on-prem development groups that are creating software for customers that need to deliver on a maybe a quarterly basis, not as strict of a timeline there, but our cloud-based solutions. You know, uptime availability for a SaaS-based solution is very different as well. So there, there was a lot of diversity and complexity within the Avanti uh, ecosystem, wasn't there? Oh, absolutely. And, and that's, that's a result of having your starting point be the mission of the business, not just what do you provide, right? What are you producing or what services are you offer? It's really about where the company is going. So rather than saying Avanti produces, um, you know, the, the individual components of, of the products that we offer, it's Avanti strives towards the everywhere type workplace. We want to create a suite of products that can allow companies to provide access to their employees in a secure way anywhere in the world, right? That's the mission. So it's not about, all right, how do we make sure that this product or that product stays up and running? It's how do we support the mission? And that's where it, it added the complexities. But as you really nicely put it, Chris, it's not hard to take the mission and then say, all right, what processes support this? Okay, so we've got, I'm going to take our first question from the audience here. We've got a question from Steve. He's asking, what data did you need to source and how did you go about it? When I used the, the term exploratory um, for those initial stages of the BIA, it, it really is. A lot of it is groundwork. It's talking to the stakeholders. Sometimes that starts at department heads because that's a really easy divide for most organizations, um, HR, sales, you know, et cetera. And then it's saying, okay, uh, you have to walk them through what the objective is and what the end result is and help them understand what a process is because you're relying on the people who specialize in your various parts of the organization to help you understand uh, you know, wh which processes exist and, and why they're important. So it's a really good question. And I, I know we like to be as data driven as possible. And certainly more mature organizations will have the opportunity to look at things like 
um, uh, financial figures. Um, perhaps mm-hmm. it's the number of request tickets that are coming in. Perhaps it's number of events that are happening. I, I would certainly draw on all of the information that you have available in your organization, but I wouldn't limit it initially when you're trying to decide where you want to focus your business impact analysis initially. I, I would absolutely do the groundwork and just talk to people and then look at the data and see how it supports it. As you were doing this, uh, could you quantify in purely financial terms the impact to the business in a lot of these areas? Or if not, why or why wasn't it necessary in some cases to quantify uh, the fin- in, in financial terms versus uh, just business impact? Well, for uh, a typical business impact analysis, you're looking at um, uh, five things, right? Financial is certainly one of them. Uh, The others are reputational. Then you've got regulatory or or social. Um, You've got output, like production, the availability to keep, keep your business running, and environmental impact. Now, you can argue that all of those can be whittled down into just a dollar amount. And oftentimes that's what we strive to do because, uh, you know, finances is the language of business and that's how we help communicate to leadership and make decisions. Um, But it doesn't necessarily have to be a dollar figure, right? Especially when you get into more uh, fluffier types of impact like reputational, right? What would be the uh, uh, impact to our brand if this event were to occur and we had to respond in a certain way. Um, it, it takes some finesse and sometimes some creativity and certainly a lot of input from various people in your organization. Yeah. And I think to help that process move along uh, is to look at it in terms of magnitude versus exact dollars at the get go. And even the same with in terms of risk uh, that may impact those outcomes you know, whether it be low, medium, high or order of magnitude, um, I think that would help organizations at least move along the conversation and provide some focus in the BIA activity versus trying to chase all possible outcomes. Yeah, and I think a, a good example that I think most of our audience is probably painfully familiar with over the past few years. After you've done the, the BIA, you know, it, hey, if a certain part of our business is impacted, Here's, you know, the impact that would occur. But if you take a specific event like ransomware, uh, I think, you know, Amanda, to your point, there is a cost quantification you can do there. But ransomware may also have a legal or privacy related and also a reputational risk element that you need to account for in that assessment. So that might be a really good example of a type of threat that you want to use to to understand those other aspects besides just the the financial piece alone. Yeah, absolutely. And Rob brings up a, a really good point, right? My uh, my starting point was understanding the business. Um, but but Chris, your first question about the frameworks, I think is is really where your starting point is, right? Because in advance, you need to define the things that Rob is talking about, like the various levels of impact. We try to make those as quantitative as possible, but sometimes a low, medium, and high, as long as you define those, can still drive the ability for decision-making. 